turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, just the next book over, Romans chapter 4. We may need some reinforcements with that children's church crowd that just left. Uh, Romans 4, uh, verses 9 through 16 is what we'll be looking at this morning. I'm going to read it first, so we are familiar with it. Continuing the discussion of Abraham, the example of salvation, the example of justification by faith. So starting in verse 9, it says, Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if, the, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there also is no violation. For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This is our passage for this morning. The world's single largest religious event is known as Ma Kumbh Mela. It is in India, it is a Hindu festival, and it comes around roughly once every six years. It is located at the place where the Ganges and the Umana River converge, combined with certain astrological calculations is how they find the specific day to have this festival. It is said that if one bathes in the waters where the two rivers converge, then they will go to heaven because the waters will wash away sin. Even more than that, those who shave their entire bodies and throw their hair into the water for every hair cast in the river a million years in heaven is promised people travel from all over they have millions who participate in this festival and those that do are very devout and very committed to this event but the question is Is this the truth? Does this procedure, does this event, does it actually wash away sins? Does it provide heaven? Is that the right conclusion that we should come to about how salvation can be obtained? What Paul is doing in chapters 3 and 4 is he is speaking about salvation. He is discussing the, the, God's path to salvation, which is justification by faith, being declared righteous by God. And he has used Abraham as the supreme example of justification by faith. And those who are reading this, who may be of Jewish descent, may be wondering, wait a second, if it's by faith only, then what about this whole circumcision thing? Why did God tell him to do that? Why did God demand that? And what about the law? Doesn't he have to keep the law? 
Doesn't he have to do what God says? How does this relate to his salvation? How can this be justification by faith only? And what Paul's doing here in verses 9 through 16 is he's giving us an analyzation of the salvation of Abraham. He's analyzing it. Let's get into the details of how Abraham was made right with God. And the way that he does it, I think the way you can break it down, is he gives two wrong conclusions and two right conclusions. This is not how he was saved. This is how he was saved. And this has tremendous implications for anyone else's salvation in the future. How was Abraham saved? And is that then the prototype of how everyone else comes to salvation? Let's look at the analysis of Abraham's salvation here. And number one, the wrong, two, first of the wrong conclusions about Abraham's salvation, it was not by ceremony. It was not by ceremony, religious ceremony to be specific. When the average person outside of the church thinks of religion, they probably, this is probably the first thing that comes to mind. They associate religion with rituals and ceremonies and procedures. Things that the adherents must participate in and partake in. These sort of mystical practices that religious people do. And we know that there are all over the place things, kind of religious ceremonies that people do. There is a specific protocol that people have to adhere to. Do it the right way. And it could be something like throwing your hair in a river, but the Jewish religion also had relig uh, certain religious rituals and ceremonies as well. The first and foremost being circumcision. Circumcision. When the male is eight days old. You say, where does this come from? This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 17. This goes all the way back to Abraham. For him to do and to all of his male descendants. It is the sign of the covenant. It is the sign of the promise that God gave him. Clearly marking off Abraham's physical descendants from everyone else in the world. It was very important. It was not something trivial. And so some might conclude, well, wait a second. If he's the start of circumcision, right, it came about through Abraham, then is that the start of his salvation? Because some might think that. He got saved, or to put it another way, he was right with God when he did the ceremony, right? He was right with God when he performed the ritual. See, this is what makes you right with God. This was the view of some of the Jews of Paul's day, you are saved by your circumcision. But I believe in Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. Believe in Jesus. All of that is great and good, but also you must be circumcised. That was the problem that we read earlier in Acts chapter 15, right? Great. These Gentile believers have come to faith in Christ. Now we must administer circumcision to them in order to truly be right with God. That was the problem also in the Galatian churches, why Paul had to write his letter to the Galatians. Because one prominent rabbi even says this, no circumcised man will ever see hell. And so you see the importance there. A ceremony that you must do in order to be right with God. Well, what Paul's going to say in verses 9 through 12 is, no, that's not correct. That's not true. He just spoke of the blessings of justification uh, in verse 3. Abraham believed and it was credited. And then he gives the testimony of David in verses 7 and 8. Blessed are those right, who have been forgiven. Blessed is the man who is not credited as a sinner, verse 8. And then he asked the question in verse 9 in our text. Is this blessing, this blessing of justification, is this on the circumcised only? Or does this blessing extend to the uncircumcised? You say, well, Abraham and David, I mean, they were both Jews. They were both circumcised, right? So the blessing of justification only comes to them, right? Is that right? But watch verse 10. How then was it credited? 
Was it while he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? So he's going to Abraham. Was Abraham declared right by God when he was circumcised or when he was uncircumcised? And he tells the answer. Verse 10. Not while circumcised, while uncircumcised. If he was right with God at the moment of his circumcision and never before, then you could say, see, this is required for salvation. But that's not the case. And all you have to do is look at the chronological narrative of the Bible to see this to be true. Abraham was declared righteous by God there at the end of verse 9. He believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. That was in Genesis 15. And circumcision is not given and explained until Genesis 17. And scholars differ about how much time has elapsed. There are some that say it was 14 years. Some say 29 years. But the point is, Abraham was declared right with God at least 14 years before God even brought up the idea of circumcision. So that cannot be a requirement for his salvation. He was right with God absent of any religious ceremony or ritual. In fact, to further the point, verse 11... He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. You see that? He was told of the sign while he was uncircumcised. And of course that makes sense. He was told of the sign, so that means he wasn't yet, right? And so you could say he was justified before God as a Gentile. An uncircumcised Gentile. And this is very important. This tells us that religious works or religious ceremony has absolutely no bearing on salvation. It was not the grounds of his acceptance before God. It is not required to begin a relationship with God. Your religious performance bears no weight in coming to salvation. And maybe we nod sort of silently and say, I know this. But this is still hard for us to really come to grips with. I remember listening to a, a man speak and speaking at a, a Good Friday service and literally uttering the words, you must be baptized in order to be saved. And I remember thinking, that is a religious ceremony. Somebody may think, well, church attendance, that is what you have to do in order to be saved. The taking of communion, the, the praying of the sinner's prayer. You came to Jesus, what did you say when you came to Jesus? Because you've got to make sure you get the words right. All of those church ceremonies and rituals are meaningless, listen carefully, in regards to salvation. In regards to salvation. Are they meaningless overall? No. The Lord tells us to get baptized and take communion and go to church and things like that. But in regards to our salvation, that has no bearing. And I have to speak about this for a moment because it's very important and it's very personal to me. And one of the things I want to address for just a moment is that much is made of the similarities between uh, evangelical Protestantism and the Roman Catholic Church. That there are many similarities. There is much that is the same. But there is also much that is different. And we cannot ignore some of those differences. In fact, one key difference is the means of salvation. The way of salvation. Because the official teaching of the Catholic Church is that salvation comes to an individual through the performing of the sacraments. That infant baptism is the conferring of grace upon a person, the removal of original sin, and then the taking of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper is the continuing in a state of grace throughout the rest of your life. And the other sacraments as well, confirmation, confirmation, 
uh, last rites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of those sacraments actually confer grace and forgiveness from God to the participants. And so the point is, they must be administered in the right manner. That means you can't do it on your own. You can't say, well, I took the Lord's Supper at home on my own. No, 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 that's not good enough. It's got to be done correctly in the church. And it doesn't matter what the recipient thinks or feels about these ceremonies. As long as they're done right, their work is secured. You say, what does that mean? That means the person doing these ceremonies has no moral obligation whatsoever. There's no obligation saying, well, you have to be this kind of person in order to come and take communion. Just take the communion. In fact, the person really doesn't even have to believe in them at all. Do the ceremony in the appropriate manner and it will bring grace to you. That's the official doctrine of the church. And I don't know how we can see this teaching and this doctrine and say, I don't, I don't understand this as anything else but salvation by religious ceremony. If we reject the shaving of hair and tossing it into a river as something that will give eternal life, then shouldn't we reject all religious ceremony that is said to bring eternal life? Even a ceremony that has the name Jesus attached to it? Or even such a significant one like circumcision. For Paul to say, it is not a part of salvation, then all ceremony is not a part of salvation. We can be tempted to trust in our religious performance, our religious ceremony for our salvation. I said it and I really meant it. Or I go, therefore I am. But no, friends, look to the example of Abraham. He was right with God before he had done any kind of religious ritual. He was saved an uncircumcised Gentile. And so circumcision is not a condition of justification. It has nothing to do with being declared right with God. And neither is any religious ceremony. And this is important also because Abraham can now be the, the spiritual father of anyone. If you notice there in verse 11, he says that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So the person who, completely ignorant of all religious ceremony, doesn't know anything about it, never done anything, that person, by believing in Christ, can be on par with Abraham. What we mean is in right standing with God. If Abraham is in full right standing with God, then I can be too just by believing in Christ. You say, well, what about the Jew? Verse 12. He's the father of, of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, like they've done the procedure, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. Following in faith. Abraham becomes your spiritual father when you believe. And so just imagine for a second, you have two people, two examples I'll give to you. You have Paul, the fastidious religious Jew, seemingly perfect in all of his religious duties. He did every single one, saved by faith, by Christ, a child of Abraham. And then you have the thief on the cross, last second belief, last second confession, performed no ceremony, did no work, not circumcised, not baptized, saved by Christ, through faith alone, a child of Abraham. And so we don't point people towards religious exercises. We don't point people toward religious duty. We point them to Christ and to him alone. And so Abraham was not saved by religious ceremony. Secondly, it was not by conduct. It was not by conduct. And what we mean by that is the keeping of the law. As he begins in verse 13, the promise that God made to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law. So again, he's telling them, don't think that Abraham was saved by his keeping of the law. God made a promise to Abraham that was given in Genesis 12 and it's repeated numerous times throughout Genesis. And basically inherent to the promise was God promised him a land the land of Canaan, God promised him a people, more descendants than he can ever count, and God promised a blessing 
the world would be blessed by his descendants. And Paul calls it here in verse 13 that the heir of the world, and I think really that's a reference to Christ, the coming Messiah that would come through right, the, the descendants, the loins of Abraham. He would be an heir to the world, and he belongs to Abraham. Therefore, Abraham's descendant rules the world, right? But back to the point, the point is there in verse 13, it was not through the law. His salvation was not predicated on how well he kept God's law. It was not about his conduct, his behavior, or his moral uprightness. And there's one way to know this for absolute sure. And here it is. The law was not given when Abraham was justified. The law was given through Moses, which came over 400 years later. So you could never say Abraham was saved by his keeping of the law. The law was not even given yet. It's like saying, well, George Washington consulted the Constitution to decide that there should be a revolution against England. No, the Constitution was written after the war. And so we make it clear that salvation is not by your merit earned in keeping God's rules. Again, as most people think is the case. Most people out there in the world. Even Jewish people who say Abraham is the most righteous, law-keeping Jew that there ever was. Well, there's just a problem with that. The law wasn't given yet, so he couldn't be saved through the law. And there's more reasons why. He goes into it, verse 14. If those who are of the law are heirs, like, right? If you get to be an heir of Abraham through just keeping the law, then what? Verse 14, faith is void. Faith is meaningless. You don't even need it. What's the point? Do you have faith? I don't know. I don't need faith. I've done my deeds. And he also says the promise is nullified there in verse 14. The promise to Abraham gets nullified. God made the promise to Abraham when he had done nothing. Remember? He was a pagan, idolatrous moon worshiper from the Ur of the Chaldees. And God made him a promise. God came to him and gave him a unilateral, unconditional promise. There were no stipulations to it. I'm going to do this for you, Abraham. That's all Abraham had to go on, and he believed. He left his home and he left everything and he followed God. But God never said to him, Abraham, this promise is going to be based on your behavior. So you better be good. If that's the case, it really wouldn't be a promise, would it? It would be more of a, a reciprocal thing. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It would be something earned. It wouldn't be a promise. You can go all the way back to verse 4. If you work then your wage is not a favor. It's not grace. It's due. If God said, keep the law, Abraham, and then you'll be saved, and he kept that law, he would have earned it. No need for the promise. In fact, we even know that the keeping of the law perfectly was never even possible. So it would be a pretty sad promise of God to say, do this perfectly, and I will do this for you, when he knows we can't do it. That would be like me making a promise to my children saying, if you behave perfectly all your life, I will give you a brand new car on your 16th birthday. And the one time they you know, spill their milk, sorry, you nullified the promise. That's a pretty lame promise, isn't it? Because you know it can never be achieved. There's even another reason why it can't be through the law. Verse 15, the law brings about wrath. This is what the law does. The law condemns. The law doesn't save. The law is not a pathway to salvation. The law is a revelation of our sin. He says where there is no law, there is no violation. You say, wait a second, was there ever sin before the law? Of course there was sin before the law. Moral wrong existed but there were no specific transgressions or violations of God's specific law because he hadn't given it yet. 
But now God has a law, and that law brings punishment when broken. Abraham's salvation was not based on the law. He was not saved by his works. And if that is the case, then no one after him is saved that way either. And we've already covered this in depth through this salvation portion. But one of the largest satanic deceptions that is in the world today is that good people are rewarded heaven. You live a life of virtue and truth and morality and goodness, and God will reward you with heaven. He will grant you heaven because of your behavior and conduct. And what's so striking is the Bible says the absolute opposite. The Bible says, no, the law cannot save. The law only further condemns you. And Abraham is the picture of someone not saved by his conduct. He was declared righteous by God through his faith before he had done anything. And that is critically important. You say, say, okay, well, if he's not saved by ceremony and he's not saved by conduct, how is he saved? Well, let's go to the two right conclusions. How did his salvation come? Number one, it was by faith. It was by faith. Beginning of verse 16. For this reason, because of what I've just said, it is by faith. It must be faith because it is not ceremony and it is not conduct. And faith has been the thread running through this entire passage. Look closely. Verse 3, Abraham believed God. Verse 5, belief in Him. Verse 11, the righteousness of faith, the Father of all who believe. Verse 12, follow in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Verse 13, through the righteousness of faith. What is the key theme? Faith. The faith of Abraham was that channel of salvation. And his faith is truly a, a remarkable thing, and that's how the, the chapter ends. We'll look at that next time. The details of his faith, believing in the power of God to bring him in air when he was 100 years old. Belief in God that a God he'd never met, God he had no history with, to just suddenly say, leave your home, leave everything you've ever known and follow me. And Abraham just steps out in faith and follows him. All Abraham had to go on was God's word. God made a promise to him. The only thing he had was that promise. And what's an amazing similarity is, I don't know about you, I've never seen God. I've never had a meeting with God. You know what I have from God? I have his promises right here in the word. And God says to believe and trust him. So me living by faith according to his word is in accordance with Abraham. I'm just going to live by faith in what God says. Faith and faith alone. And faith is from the human perspective, but secondly... It was by grace, and this is the divine perspective. Verse 16, in order that it may be accordance with grace. Faith and grace. Faith is what man does, grace is what God does. Grace is God's goodness to sinners, and Abraham received God's grace. You, you think about it, why did Abraham receive the promise and not his brother Nahor? Why are we not talking about Nahor? I don't know. It's God's grace. God's grace to Abraham. Why did God promise such good to him? A land, a people, world, blessing for all time. This is the grace of God. And so from the human side, we see, oh, that person believed. From the divine side, we know God gave his grace to that sinner. And this is so well summarized in the familiar verse that we know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
It's just as true in the life of Abraham as it is in anyone else's life. Now, this passage is important to us really for two reasons. And the first is that this is the gospel. This is exactly what the gospel is, friends. It is good news. We are not saved by our ceremony or our conduct. It is not because of your deeds or your works. It is by grace through faith. And that is the testimony of the entire Bible all the way back from Abraham. All the way to the tribulation. People are saved by faith. This is how man can be saved from the problem of his sin. Grace through faith. But also in this text, we've kind of alluded to it already, Abraham is the father of all who believe. The spiritual father. This is something that's been running through the text too. Verse 11, the father of all who believe. Verse 13, his descendants. Verse 14, heirs with him. And here it is again in verse 16. The promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, see, not only to Jews, but also to those who are the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Paul is talking about all believers in Christ. Abraham is their spiritual father. Abraham and his salvation by grace through faith, not of ceremony and not of conduct, he becomes now the prototype of how everyone is saved from here on out. Faith can be credited to any person in the same way. They just believe. They need to believe. And so you here this morning, you have no ethnic, no national identity with Abraham. At least I think so. But you have a spiritual identity with him. He's the father of all who believe. And so when it comes down to it, Abraham the pagan, idolatrous sinner who did not trust in his own performance, his own works, his own efforts, only trusted in the gracious promise of God, was declared right by God, declared fully righteous in his sight. And that promise is available for any person today. You come to God with nothing, and all you can do is believe. And so you just, you cast aside any ceremony, any conduct that you might trust in for your salvation. It's worthless. It does nothing for you to save you. It is only grace through faith. That is what is priceless. And so if you sit here this morning and you're right with God and you've been declared right by God... Marvel in the saving work and the grace of God. Sing to Him. Worship Him. Live for Him. Because of His saving grace, making you right, declaring you righteous when you had done nothing. And all you can do now is say, Lord, I, I devote and I give my life to You for what You have done for me. Lord, I'm not trying to earn it. I'm not trying to pay You back. I am a receiver of your gift and your grace. And so, Lord, that now becomes the, the fuel for my Christian life. Look at what God has done for me. What can I do for him? This is Abraham's salvation. And next time we will look at Abraham's faith and how we can imitate his faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this word. Lord, this is the gospel. This is the good news. We can rejoice in it. We can celebrate it. Lord, and the offer is there for anyone to place their faith in this great Savior. We just marvel at your love for us and all that you do for us, Lord. We devote our lives now to you in your service for your kingdom, for your glory. Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we have a closing hymn here, just one verse. Let's stand together. Sing it out if you are amazed of the love of Jesus for you.
stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall end. seated. Uh, we have one thing to do here as we close. We had our annual meeting just a couple weeks ago, but we swear in our new uh, deacons and deaconesses, and we had a couple that weren't able uh, to be there at that, so I'm going to call them up at this time. Um, Suzette and Elliot and uh, Junior and Corey, so please just come up here to the front, and I have a number of questions that I have to ask you according to our bylaws and then to the church, and then we'll uh, close our time in prayer here. So I'm going to ask these um, questions, and hopefully you answer in the affirmative, okay? Uh, five questions. Number one, <clears throat> do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Yes. Do you accept the doctrinal standards of this church as being in harmony with the sacred scriptures and founded on the Word of God? Do you approve the way that this church is constituted and governed and will seek to promote its welfare and effectiveness in and through the office to which you've been called? Do you accept the office of, uh, in this case, deacon and deaconess in this congregation and do you promise to perform all the duties thereof by God's grace and to the best of your ability? Do you promise to study and promote the peace, unity, and purity of the church? And so now I... I'm going to ask the members of the church the, this question. Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive these brothers and sisters as ruling, and do you promise to yield to them the honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which the word of God and the bylaws of this church entitle them? Okay. Well, they are now installed, so let me close our service in prayer here. Father, we thank you for... Uh, calling leaders to your church, Lord. Um, we're so grateful for that. You promised that you would, and you're keeping your promise. Lord, we're always amazed, Lord, the more and more people we see that testify of the saving work of God, the justification of God, the declaring righteous of God by faith alone, through your grace alone, Lord. Um, it's a wonderful celebration, and thank you for uh, just giving the lives of these individuals and the others as well, Lord, who um, already testified a couple weeks back of your saving work in their life. We pray for their growth, and we pray for our church's growth. Lord, we pray for our rejoicing and celebration in the saving work of God being all of grace and only through faith, Lord. And we thank you for this morning. It's in Christ's name that we pray, and all the church said, amen. amen. And you are dismissed this morning.